Hello, everybody. Welcome. I am Cameron Littlin with the Bremen Museum, and I'm going to turn it over to Michael Hart Hillman to get started with our NCJW 125th anniversary past president's panel. Welcome. As we like to say in the South, welcome, y'all. We're so glad you're joining us tonight to celebrate NCJW's Atlanta Section's 125th anniversary. I am Michael Hart Hillman, and together with my daughter, Ansley Hillman Clare, we are co chairing Council's event. I also want to introduce you to our co sponsoring partner, the Bremen Museum, <clears throat> and their executive director, Leslie Gordon. A big thank you to Leslie and the Bremen for all of their support, their technical finesse, and their sponsorship. National Council of Jewish Women, the UGO, at the 1893 World's Fair. In 1895, just two short years later, a group of Atlanta women met at the temple and formed the Atlanta section of NCJW, which many of us affectionately call Council. On a timeline from 1895 to now, 2020, and immersed in the debates of the women's movement through history, Council represents the intersectionality of both the modernization and the renewal of Jewish womanhood locally and nationally. Council in Atlanta will be where Council has always been, at the forefront of social change, promoting the needs of women, children, and families, and striving to ensure the rights and freedoms of all. Council's uniqueness is her ability to weave a tapestry of American and Jewish culture that reflects the role and activism of women. In 1931, my grandmother, Alma Hertz Logman, was president of the Montgomery, Alabama section of NCJW. My mother, Carol Logman Hart, followed in her footsteps. And now, with my daughters, Ansley and Brittany, we represent four generations of council women. In my girls' young and adolescent years, they would frequently ask me, so where are you going this morning and what will you be doing? And I would say to them, I'm going to a Sedaka party. I'm going to another meeting at council. As we zoom around together tonight, please listen for historical and generational information that our remarkable and accomplished panelists will share. As they reveal their stories, they will illuminate NCJW's rich and illustrious contributions to our Atlanta community. Tonight, my council experiences have come full circle. My very dear friend and mentor, Marilyn Shubin, installed me as the Evening Branch President in 1975. Now, it is my heartfelt honor to introduce you to NCJW's 1967-69 President, Marilyn Shubin. Good evening. I'm very happy to be here, and here's why I said yes. One, was there any answer but yes to Michael Hillman's request for some reflections? Two, my firm belief has always been find a way to say yes when someone asks for your participation. Three, I have accrued a large debt to NCJW, which I can never repay. Saying yes as a young woman to incredible opportunities provided by council involvement, created a pathway for my future. The Council of Jewish Women, as you have heard, has played a role in the history of the United States for 125 years, our cause for celebration. My connection began 60 years ago. I must be the oldest blast from the past. My tale of two, of two cities happens to be three. One, born, educated, married, city number one, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, the East. Two, children, spouse's career move, joined council, city number two, Cleveland, Ohio, the Midwest. Three, 
home since 1962, city number three, Atlanta, the South, a trifecta which exposed me to three different perspectives, each with a rich history. To my good fortune, my interest in community and exploring volunteering was piqued in Cleveland, a model Jewish community by every measure. The Cleveland section informed the Atlanta section of our relocation, and in a few weeks, I found myself at the Council House, 793 Piedmont, which became my home away from home. The Golden Age Club, the Golden Age Employment Service, all meetings and section business emanated from there. From its inception, Atlanta and sections throughout the country were always in the vanguard on social issues, inspired by Council's two giant pillars, faith and humanity. All of our efforts were committed to the precept of Tukun Olam. Confronting the turbulent 60s was an heroic attempt. The 60s, an epic era of glory and horror. The benefit of guidance and strength derived from the national organization was empowering. How else to digest and incorporate the results of historic landmark legislation into meaningful programming? Imagine the following events unfolding, and this is just a sample. The Civil Rights and Voting Rights Acts, the March on Washington and the I Have a Dream speech, the marches from Selma, Alabama, and the courage of John Lewis of blessed memory, assassinations of JFK, MLK, RFK, the Vietnam War student protests, our leadership role in the WICS Job Corps efforts, our support and attendance at the dinner honoring Martin Luther King after he received the Nobel Peace Prize. One of my most vivid memories with a story for another time. All this is background. The section continued to spotlight local needs and address them with pilot programs in cooperation and collaboration with local, county, and state public officials. Saying yes continued to provide me with wonderful aha moments, always opening new doors in the NCJW family, and which led to a professional career based wholly on a resume of my service as a volunteer lay leader with council. Thanks for the privilege of sharing these reflections and a salute to the past presidents whose stories we are about to hear. And now to Ansley, our co-chair. Thank you, Marilyn. That brought chills listening to what you had to say. I'm Ansley Clare, and it is my pleasure and honor to be able to share and co-chair my first NCJW event with my mom, whom I've always admired. Today, my mom and I can now share NCJW with yet another generation, the door by door, as my 11-year-old daughter, Layla, is joining us tonight. My introduction to, to NCJW probably started in diapers with my mom dragging me all around her to the meetings. And it continues to this day as I watch and engage with passionate Jewish women who've come together to advocate and educate around women and children's issues. My whole childhood is full of memories of council meetings and Barganada. Barganada was this elusive, darkish warehouse with rows and rows and racks and tables of gently used clothes and merchandise at 781 Miami Circle. It was a child's greatest indoor hide and seek playground and probably my mom's worst nightmare. So even though I think my sister and I were brought in to help at times, I'm not sure what help really looked like. You'll hear more about Barganada from each of our panelists, but in brief, it was another council program designed as a thrift store sale twice a year to help outfit women while also providing financial support for the Atlanta chapter's growing number of projects. Rebecca Atkinson was the Barganada warehouse manager for 30-ish years. She is on the call tonight. I just wanted to give her a shout out. With this, I turn you over to our moderator who has won many awards for her leadership, creativity, and ability to create community through a cultural lens. 
She currently serves as the Executive Director of the Bremen Jewish Heritage Museum. Please give a warm welcome to Leslie Gordon. So thank you so much. It's really an honor for me to have gotten to know all of these incredible women. Uh, Ansley and I did a one hour interview with each of them. So it's been really fabulous uh, for me to really get to know everybody better. I knew them all from their accomplishments, but now I know them even more about even more of their accomplishments as part of NCJW. So uh, let me introduce your panel who you see on the screen. First, Beth Sugarman who was president from 1981 to 1983. Nancy Levine, president from 1985 to 1987. Lila Hertz, 1990 to 1992. And Lucy Sunshine, 1998 to 2000. So a little bit of history. Uh, section president, Mrs. Ethel Myers. Uh, 1929 to 1931 got involved because she said she would uh, because of being Jewish and I wanted to help others in whatever way I could. So I would love to hear from each of you how you got involved in NCJW. Let's start with you Beth. Tell us about how you became involved and how your family was involved. Atlanta Section had adopted the ward as a community service project in 1947 which by the way was the first time the, any civic group had adopted an entire ward at Grady. The volunteers assisted with bathing, feeding, and entertaining the children. When I was living at home while attending Emory in 1962, my mother was president of the Atlanta section. I intercepted many, many phone calls about council business and learned a lot about what was going on in the section. After I married and returned to Atlanta in 1966, I remember being invited to a membership tea. Punch and sweets were served. I thought the punch was delicious, so I asked for a copy of the recipe, which is actually still in my recipe file, and I'm happy to share it with anybody that would like it. <laughs> Joining council was just what you did as a young married Jewish woman in Atlanta. I served in many different roles throughout the years, including bulletin editor, Barganata chair, secretary, community services vice president, and in 1981, had the honor of being installed as president of the Atlanta section by my mother. It was quite meaningful for me to be carrying on the work that was such an important part of my mother's life. Today, I am thrilled that on September the 1st, my daughter Pam Sugarman, also an Atlanta section member, will begin presenting a five session program for Atlanta section members on seeing whiteness for anti-racist action. This is an opportunity for white people to realize how being white matters and develop skills and stamina to be anti-racist more of the time. Nice to know that good work is continuing here also, La Dor Fador. Thank you. So Nancy, what got you involved? Well, first I wanna say what an honor it is to be on this panel. In my NCJW career, I've worked alongside of everyone associated with this program, and I'm grateful for the friendships that I've made and the memories that NCJW has given me. When Marshall and I moved to Atlanta, we had an 18 month old. I was pregnant with my second child and I didn't know a soul. My first goal was to find friends and I was lucky that my first two were my neighbors, Michael Hillman, who was active in NCJW's evening branch and Betty Ann Schusterman, who was active at the AA synagogue. I was deeply impressed with their love for both of these organizations. And in time, I too loved them and was honored to serve as president in both. My husband, Marshall, met Mark Silverman at Piedmont Hospital, and Mark and Diana invited us to dinner two weeks after we moved to Atlanta. At that time, Diana was president of NCJW, and um, she invited me to the opening meeting. When I arrived, um, Diana sat me at a table with her friends, Everyone was extremely warm and welcoming. NCJW impressed me immediately for the following reasons. Jewish was its middle name. NCJW was a national women's organization that was not associated with a national men's association. And NCJW's issues reflected my own. Women and children, the elderly and Israel. I signed up on the spot. Fabulous. Thank you. Lila, what's your story with NCJW? 
Good evening, and thank you so much for inviting me to do this. And I too enjoyed our one hour phone call, um, Ansley and Leslie. That was really good to get to know you and to go over things uh, from the past. My mother-in-law, when I moved to Atlanta, I was also very young and newlywed, and my mother-in-law introduced me to who would become my very closest friend in Atlanta on our first lunch date. And a few years later, we both had children and uh, we were at home and getting a little bit fidgety and wanting to do some good for the community. So I went back to my mother-in-law again and I said, what should I do with my time? Where, where, what organization should I join? And she said, the National Council of Jewish Women, you've got to join NCJW. Of course, everybody called it council then, but we then were, were instructed to call it NCJW. So um, I joined, I had a very uh, young baby. So uh, Ansley, you were not the only child in diapers in the Bargainada warehouse. And one of my first jobs was co-chairing co -chairing Bargainada with my closest friend. And um, it, it was, and then I went on to do all kinds of other things. I think I was vice president of almost every department and then became president in 1990. And I'm very honored to have had this um, experience. Thank you. Thank you. Lucy, share your story about your involvement. Well, I was always involved in NCJW. My mother was a president of Houston section. And when we moved to Atlanta in 1964, when I was 12, of course, the first thing she did was contact NCJW. And I just came along. As a teenager, we gave parties at Grady Hospital in the children's ward. And later, I would help with the precursor to Bargainada, which was the sales at the thrift shop on Piedmont. She made me a life member when I married. She always said all her best friends came from NCJW, and the same was true for me. Thank you all. So according to past presidents, um, NCJW continues to be the organization that improves the world through Tikkun Olam and women's, advocates for women's rights. NCJW has always anticipated needs, like Marilyn said, and created programs to fill those needs. Uh, for example, back in 1954, the Atlanta section was kind of on the cutting edge of innovation, and among the many acknowledged needs that were identified in the community were activities and care for what was then termed uh, golden agers. Um, a pilot project was envisioned in 79 for older persons with limited dependency needs. And Beth, I would love to hear from you because under your leadership, this project, the Con Home, opened. Can you talk to us about that? Actually, it didn't open under my, um, during my presidency. It opened um, in 1979 under Roz Cohen's presidency, but I was extremely involved and involved for a long time. Um, the, cutting, the Con Home was a cutting edge example of assisted living long before this term was ever used. A committee of the section under the very capable leadership of the late Margaret Weiler began researching and developing the concept of a facility in which a group of people could live together in a home, each with their own room, with which they would furnish with their own possessions, but share the communal living spaces with the other residents. All meals would be provided so as to relieve the residents of shopping and cooking responsibilities. The goal was to prevent premature institutionalization for people who just needed a little help, but not full nursing home care. This would enable the residents to maintain their independence and save the expense of a nursing home. After a difficult process of trying to locate a facility for this pilot project, a home was identified in the Morningside area of Atlanta. It had been the family home of the Herbert Taylors. Through the generosity of the Atlanta Jewish community, Mr. and Mrs. Herbert Taylor, and the dedication of Atlanta Section volunteers, the home, which was named for Mrs. T uh, Mrs. Taylor's brother, the Lewis Kahn Group Home for the Elderly, opened in April of 1979. There were residents living on three levels with a chairlift that, uh, going up and down the stairs that operated most of the time so that any handicapped residents would have access to the different levels of the home. The growing pains were enormous, from bees in the walls that kept returning every spring, even though each time they were removed with many, many hundreds of pounds of honey, we were assured they would not return. For years, we dealt with all the issues that come along with an older home. 
We persevered and weathered many ups and downs and were finally rewarded with a bequest from a family which enabled us to build our dream facility, which would house 44 people, including a memory care section. In September of 2001, the Kahn home became the Coin home, which is located in Johns Creek and is now a part of the Jewish home life communities. It is thriving and fulfilling our original goal of enabling the elderly to live in a home-like setting and to prevent premature institutionalization. Inga Rudman, who was chair of the, of the Kahn Home Committee and who actually ran the home as a volunteer before we hired paid staff, and Betty Breen, another Atlanta section volunteer, wrote an intermediate step, a manual for establishing a congregate living facility for the elderly. Here is a copy. Lots of pages with lots of valuable information, which we shared with other sections all over the country. Thank you. Nancy, the court-appointed special advocate program, or CASA, began during your presidency. Can you talk about CASA and why it was and still is important? Yes, this is a great question. Thanks, Leslie. I'm delighted to tell you about the court-appointed special advocate program. It's a wonderful program that trains volunteers to work in the courts as advocates on behalf of abused and neglected children. By the time our section started CASA, it had been successfully implemented in 15 other NCJW sections around the country and it had a fabulous track record. In late 1985, with the support of President Ronald Reagan and the Department of Justice, the Department of Health and Human Services gave national NCJW. In my first year as president, Atlanta section received a $1,000 grant to launch community assessments in Cobb, Fulton, and DeKalb counties to determine the local support for a CASA program. In 1990, the first CASA volunteers were sworn in, and I'm very, very happy to say that today, Georgia CASA supports 46 affiliate programs across the state. Fantastic. Thank you. Lila. You spoke to Ansley and me a lot about all the important work that NCJW was involved in during the years. Can you talk about that work? Well, I'm going to echo what everyone else has said, that um, the, the goal of the NCJW projects was we would, we would find a need in the community, we would research it, we would make sure that it wasn't duplicated anywhere else, we would take it on, and then we would spin it off to the community. And at the time that I was... Um, president of the board. We did a lot, we had a lot of advocacy going on then. Um, Nancy Levine was, um, she, she was the writer of the Family and Medical Leave Act, which passed while I was board president. She worked on it for years and years, and uh, we finally got it passed while, while I was president. Um, we also had a program called Every Child by Two, and it was with the Carter Center. Rosalind Carter wanted to make sure that all of the children in the United States were going to be vaccinated and we were seeing um, we were seeing data that said that people were not getting their vaccinations anymore so I was able to join in, in with the Carter Center and participate in Every Child by Two to make sure that children were getting vaccinated. That was really exciting for me. It was a very special um, experience. We, let's see, what else did we do? Um, another one of our advocacy, I'm sorry, I'm jumping around. Another one of our advocacy issues was making sure that mammograms were covered by insurance and that um, women could stay in the hospital overnight if they had mastectomies. Um, there was just so much important work we did and it was so timely and it stays so timely and it was such a joy to be able to participate in it. Lucy, when we talked, you, it, I had the pleasure of uh, hearing all about the Washington Institute. Can you talk to us about NCJW's Washington Institute? Absolutely. Washington Institute is presented every third year by NCJW in Washington, D.C. We um, join as a group from pe with people all across the country and we are trained to advocate our positions and after hearing from many speakers during the week one year we had janet reno we spend the last day in the offices of our representatives and senators and we rush from office to office uh, 
And as while we were doing that, we've had many unusual encounters, like running into Jesse Helms on the Senate train while he thought our NCJW for choice buttons were for school choice and we didn't enlighten him. He was a gallant Southerner gentleman and he personally escorted us to Sam Nunn's office. And speaking of <laughs> Sam Nunn, one time we were there, he was in an armed services committee meeting when he found out we were out in the hallway, he came out with all his aides and met with all those Jewish ladies. And of course, John Lewis was always welcoming us to his office, and he always gave out little bags of peanuts. <laughs> That's great, thank you. Education and children have always been one of the primary concerns of NCJW, and the Atlanta section's initial efforts were directed toward the formation and successful continuation of the free kindergarten program for Atlanta public schools. The Atlanta section also became part of the coalition of women's organizations that provided substitute teachers so that Atlanta teachers could attend sensitivity sessions during desegregation. And in 1968, a day treatment center for emotionally disturbed preschool children, the first of its kind in Atlanta, was opened under NCJW's leadership. So Beth, a lot of thought and planning went to make sure that all children were thought about all, all, wait, all the time over the years. Can you talk about education advocacy and programming over the last years? Thanks for mentioning the, uh, the early programs, um, Leslie. An additional important example of programs is Ship a Box, which was started nationally in 1946. Locally, we sent toys, crayons, coloring books, and handcraft material to child survivors of Nazi Germany and later to children in Israel. Atlanta section members are still participating today by making contributions on our birthdays. In the late 70s, an innovative program was developed by the NCJW Research Institute for Innovation in Education of the School of Education at Hebrew University in Jerusalem. Try saying that fast. Known as Hippie, the program was developed to address the needs of women and children who had recently immigrated from Ethiopia, Eastern Europe, and Central Asia. The program trained mothers in their homes to talk, read, and interact with their children to help them with the skills they would need when starting school. It was similar to the Head Start program, but there was an additional critical component of Hippie. Of great importance was the benefit to the mothers. As a result of their backgrounds, these women had very low self-esteem. By training them in their homes to teach their own children, they themselves gained the self-confidence to enable themselves to better adjust to their new lives in Israel. Atlanta section participated by raising funds for this critically valuable program. When Hillary Clinton was first lady of Arkansas, she uh, went to Israel and learned of the program and subsequently implemented it for the entire state of Arkansas. And it is still today active uh, throughout the world. Hello Israel was a pilot program developed by our national organization to complement sixth grade social studies lessons on the, on the Middle East. In its first year in 1991, it was presented to over 300 public school students in Atlanta. The success was recognized by the Atlanta Jewish Federation when they awarded us a grant for the program. During my administration, a group of working mothers recognized the need for childcare. As the Atlanta section NCJW Child Care Committee, they researched and developed a guide, and here it is, for establishing accredited child care facilities and Mother's Morning Out programs. This led to the establishment of a Mother's Morning Out program at Orbe Shalom Synagogue, which was subsequent, subsequently replicated by other institutions. And as we are surely aware, safe, affordable child care is unfortunately still a critical need today. Thank you so much. So, um, Nancy, after your presidency, you became state public affairs chair. Tell us about your involvement with the Family Medical Leave Act. Yes, as, as Lila mentioned, after my presidency, I became the NCJW state public affairs chairwoman for three years. Um, in those days, NCJW had a motto, and it was, one woman makes a difference. And um, while I totally believe that's true, 
being at the state capitol taught me that transformative policy making really requires the voices of many, many people advocating together. I have to say NCJW really changed my thinking about public policy. I always thought good public policy begins at the federal level and then steamrolls across the states, um, affecting all states equally. And certainly as Marilyn mentioned, um, the, the landmark legislation of the 1960s, the Voting Rights, the Civil Rights Act, and Medicare all started that way. But CASA kind of taught me that maybe good policies also can start in the states. And if they're successful, then maybe they can percolate up to the federal government and become national law. As Beth mentioned, this was happening with childcare legislation. As some of you remember in the mid 1980s, high quality, affordable and accessible childcare absolutely did not exist. NCJW and thousands of childcare advocates, parents and public officials in 40 states came together and made childcare a must win issue for Congress and the Bush administration. As a result, the Act for Better child care became law and this became another example to me about policy making. Um, I came to view the states as laboratories for national policy. In 1988, United States Representative Patricia Schroeder, a Colorado Democrat, conducted hearings on work um, family issues across the country. Represented, you probably remember her, she coined the phrase Teflon president to refer to President Ronald Reagan. The other notable quote from her is that when people questioned how is she going to balance her political life with motherhood, she would often say she had a brain and a uterus and they both worked. As she was my hero, or as Sherry Frank likes to say, Shiro. The stories at these hearings were absolutely heartbreaking. In most states, job security did not exist. Women were fired when they took maternity leave. People were fired when they took time away from work to care for a seriously ill parent, spouse, or, or child. In 1988, Representative Schroeder introduced the first family and medical leave legislation in Congress, and it failed. I was incensed. I went to Washington and I met with Sammy Moshenberg, who was NCJW's lead lobbyist. She and I then visited women at the Women's Legal Defense Fund, and I explained that the NCJW Atlanta section was going to get a family medical leave policy passed in Georgia. They told me it would be extremely hard, if not impossible, because Georgia was the worst state in the nation for job security. They did, however, connect me with um, the director of the Georgia chapter of 9 to 5, the National Working Women's Association. She and I formed a 40 organization statewide coalition. We conducted work family hearings across the state and at the state capitol. We wrote a family and medical leave bill using the very best practices from other states. And we worked with NCJW member, Georgia State Senator Kathy Steinberg and other amazing female legislators who managed our bill through the legislative process. In 1992, Governor Zell Miller signed FMLA into law. On August 5, 1993, FMLA modeled after our Georgia law became the first bill that President Bill Clinton signed into law. Amazing, we have a lot to thank you for, that's so awesome. So Lucy, under your leadership, I'm sorry, I skipped Lila, Lila's next. Lila, uh, could you talk to us about the Women of Achievement Oral History Program that NCJW took on? I can, but first I'm gonna pause for a second and point out how remarkable the NCJW women are that I followed and how intimidated I was coming in as president of the Atlanta section after Nancy Levine. She, I mean, she, she wowed me every time she spoke and she still does. Anyway, she was one of my mentors. So the Women of Achievement Oral History Program was a wonderful program that the American Jewish Committee started and they were doing interviews. They wanted to make sure that we saved interviews from 
um, prominent Atlantans, um, people that did a lot in the community for the Jewish community in Atlanta. And NCJW, we decided that it would be a good idea to make sure that we targeted women. So we did the Women of Achievement Oral History Collection, make sure that we got women's, um, women that were very involved with the community and very powerful. We got their stories so that they could um, be in, in the annals of history here. Lucy? Yes. Under your leadership, there was significant interaction with the late beloved John Lewis. Can you talk with us about him and his involvement with NCJW? Well, as I said previously, John Lewis always welcomed us into his office when we were there for Washington Institute. He was almost always allied with NCJW in the areas we felt were important, and that wasn't necessarily true of all our other representatives that we would meet with in Georgia. But pro-choice, helping women and children, he was always there. During my presidency in 1999, we chose John Lewis for our highest honor, the Hannah G. Solomon Award. The ceremony was during an MLK Shabbat weekend held at the temple. It was very moving and especially with a wonderful introduction of him from Michael Hillman. I do remember at the end, we sang, We Shall Overcome on the Bema, and I was very moved. In 2015, at the National Convention, which was in Atlanta, we bestowed the National Faith and Humanity Award to him. And I understand he left the stage dancing to his favorite song, which was Happy. Thank you for that story. So from the turn of the last century, NCJW has been always at the front, front and center with uh, welcoming Jewish immigrants to the United States, um, even starting on Ellis Island, helping for, with resettlement and uh, creating classes and helping to Americanize immigrants. And the Atlanta section helped resettle Romanians, Algerians, Poles, Hungarians, Russians, and Cubans, so in addition to those fleeing Nazi Germany after the Holocaust. So Lucy, can you talk about how you were involved in Russian resettlement with NCJW? Well, NCJW was very active in resettlement, both in New York, of course, with people coming off of Ellis Island, but also in Atlanta since its inception in 1895. I know for sure my sister-in-law's parents were helped in the late 40s when they came to Atlanta after being in displaced person camps after World War II. Also, in the late 70s and early 80s, my husband's cousins from Latvia were helped. Uh, in, the late, in the 70s through the 90s, we helped immigrants from many nations, but especially Russians. That was in the height of the Russian um, resettlement. And um, while Federation and JF and CS helped get the apartments, NCJW outfitted the apartments with dishes and glasses, sheets and towels, and filled the refrigerator for the first time. We would set aside those items from Bargainada, donations specifically for that project. And uh, I understand we helped with approximately 450 apartments in the lifetime of the project. Many times the families also came for clothes to start school and for job interviews. And with all the clothes that we always had around the warehouse for Bargainada, it was so easy. We would set up a dressing room for them and take them into the warehouse and they would be able to pick things for job interviews or school. And we've even helped people for, um, whose houses burned down and had nothing left. They would come in through another agency and we would give them clothes. Thank you so much. So um, I want to turn it over to Ansley now because she, she has some great stories about Bargainada and I think she ought to introduce our next question. Thanks, Leslie. Um, so, and thanks, Lucy, for uh, bringing that back to Bargainada is one of my favorite topics. Um, I spoke a little bit about Bargainada in my introduction, but I wanted to share an anecdote that my mom had shared with me. She said, when I was little, we had gone to a Purim carnival and I was wearing my brand new clown costume. And a woman had come up to her and said, oh, did you get that at Bargainada? And my mom said, well, yes, I didn't. She said, oh, that was my kids and I made it for both of them. So I know that many of y'all have stories to share about Bargainada. I would like to turn it over to Beth and ask her if she can start. Beth, will you start and share with us a story about Bargainada? In the early years, before we had our own warehouse, we would have to set up the sale 
in donated spaces. We would call Steve Selig, whose family had a long relationship with council, and he would locate a venue that wasn't rented and would be available for our use for the sale. The second year of the sale, I was co-chairman with Jan Coleman. The space was rather small and chopped up, and we were overwhelmed with shoppers. Lo and behold, we were visited by the fire marshal, who threatened to close us down. We agreed to limit the number of shoppers who could enter at a time, sort of like shopping today in the COVID pandemic. Another vivid memory is the time we had a squirrel in the warehouse on Miami Circle. We had a lot of loyal shoppers. Two that come to mind are a couple. We nicknamed her the squirrel. She and her husband would spend hours in the store trying on items. Before they left, they would hide or squirrel away items that they would hope to come back to purchase on half price day. Rebecca Atkinson, our amazing warehouse manager, would set out after we closed for the day and hunt for the stashes so she could add them back to the full price stock. As a follow-up, when the Whole Foods opened in Sandy Springs, I would often see the squirrel and her husband there. I could never forget them, but hopefully they forgot me. Thank you. Uh, that, was, that was super cute. Um, thanks for sharing that. Nancy, do you want to add your tale to that? First of all, my very fondest memories of Bargainot are working with Rebecca Atkinson. She is a force of nature, and our sales were successful really because of her. Um, another memory I call, a funny thing happened on my way to Bargainada. Um, when I chaired the sale one year, I noticed that a great many volunteers for the Sunday afternoon shift were canceling. I was panicked. For some reason, I was on the street, probably looking for volunteers, and I saw this darling person approaching. It was Joni Shubin. She had recently moved to Atlanta, and this was her very first volunteer job. Of course, I knew Marilyn Shubin, her mother-in-law, but I'd never met Joni. When she told me her name and that she was there to work the afternoon shift, I started hugging and kissing her all over. Um, the look on her face was, who is this crazy person and how did I get involved with this? Um, I'm happy to say that Joni and I became good friends and remain so today. And despite this crazy introduction that she had to NCJW, Joni went on to pursue many NCJW leadership roles and became a very passionate state public affairs chairwoman. So that's really lovely. Thank you, Nancy. Lila, do you want to tell us yours? Well, my first, my first best story about Barganata was um, the best advice that I ever got about Barganata was from Beth Sugarman, another one of my mentors. So Beth told me um, at the first time I volunteered, she <laughs> said, this is the only place that I come to where I wash my hands before I use the restroom. That was, big, <laughs> was really kind of a nasty, nasty place. <laughs> you never knew where everything had been before it came to to our warehouse. And Rebecca, I want to give you a shout out too. You were amazing. I loved working with you so much. So one of my favorite things to do at Bargainada was to price the designer clothing. We always would get some beautiful clothes from our members um, that were very fine designers. And people would line up and run in and race to the designer rack and buy designer clothes at like a tenth of the price from this, that, that you could buy them in the stores. And it was um, really a joy to watch people walk away with their beautiful Bill Blast dress. Um, it was just so much fun to see people enjoying those fine clothes and being able to buy them when they otherwise couldn't have been. And on a serious side, Bargainada was not only a huge fundraiser for NCJW, it was a community service in and of itself because it allowed people to outfit themselves and as Lucy pointed out, we, we would allow people to come in and get clothes if they had a fire in their house. So it ended up being both. It was a big fundraiser, but it was also a big, big community service. It certainly was. Thank you, Lila. Lucy, do you want to add your anecdote to that? Well, I also want to say hello to Rebecca because she was always the best. Um, well, I already talked about helping during the old thrift shop times, but Barcanada was huge and we had long lines to get into the warehouse 
and we would see many of the same customers from sale to sale. One of our most interesting customers were the monks who came in their saffron robes and they were very good customers. Um, Barcadotta had many volunteers just to get ready for the sale and my favorites were Minnie Kolotkin who in her 90s drove to the warehouse every Monday to help mark scarves and gloves. Also, and they would come together, Joy Howard, yes, Clark's mom, and Vida Golgar would come to mark clothes. They were always together. I'm gonna to turn this over now to Ansley for our final question and probably most important one. She's my, been my partner in crime and putting everything together. So thank you, Ansley, Ansley Claire. Thank you, Leslie. We could not have done it without you and Cameron behind the scenes, so thank you. NCJW is instrumental in training y'all and preparing y'all for your presidency. Can you share how these trainings and experiences have prepared you for your leadership roles outside of NCJW? Beth, you wanna take a stab at that one first? I, I could never have accomplished any of the things that, that I've gone on and done without my um, council experience. Um, be it running a meeting, uh, parliamentary procedure, working with volunteers, and I have to say that one of my greatest uh, joys in my, in my time as president and working with NCJW was watching the volunteers and, and, and the new people coming up and watching them learn. And uh, it, it was just, it was a terrific, a terrific, terrific uh, uh, experience. Uh, I went on and worked uh, and was involved in starting Genesis Shelter, which was a transitional housing for homeless newborns and their families. Sometimes the family was the mother and the baby. Sometimes the family was the father and the mother and the baby. Sometimes the family was the father and the baby. Sometimes the family was the mother and, and the grandmother and the baby and, and lots of siblings. Uh, this was a project that was undertaken by 11 different organizations, 10 religious or organizations, and NCJW. And uh, it, it took a quite a long time to get going, but uh, we raised the funds and we renovated a building at, at the temple and the project is still ongoing. It moved uh, a few years ago to um, Boulevard and uh, has been taken over by our house. So as, as Lila explained, the, the way we operated was identifying an unmet need in the community establishing a pilot project and then launching that project uh, as its own project or with, with another agency. So um, I've also been involved with uh, Historic Oakland Cemetery and uh, done some fundraising there and the fundraising skills that I gained from NCJW have served me well. Thank you. Uh, thanks Beth. Nancy, you wanna jump in with yours? Yes, thanks, Ansley. Um, as a result of my NCGW experiences and with the incredible support of my wonderful husband and children, I went back to graduate school and completed a PhD in political science. In one of my classes on the Supreme Court, I learned that in 1932, in his famous dissent in the case, New State Ice versus Liebman, Supreme Court Justice um, Louis Brandeis was the first to popularize the, the phrase, states are the laboratories of democracy. He stated, a state may, if its citizens choose, serve as a laboratory and try novel and social economic experiments without risk to the rest of the country. In 1997, with a grant from the Aspen Institute, my dissertation analyzed all the FMLA congressional roll call votes to demonstrate that FMLA policies diffused across a majority of American states and then percolated up to Congress to become national law. Um, upon completing my degree, 
I worked as a budget and policy analyst at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention for 17 years. I will always credit NCJW for teaching me the concept of tikkun olam. Many people have referred to that, but in Hebrew, that means repair the world. NCJ, NCJW volunteers genuinely care about others and are willing to do the work necessary to solve the problems and transform society. And it was my NCJW experiences that also led to my involvement and presidency at the AA Synagogue, where I currently co-chair the Chesed Committee with my husband. I will always credit my synagogue for teaching me the concept of Chesed, which is Hebrew for acts of loving kindness. Thanks, Ansley. Thanks, Nancy. I, I can't, I spent many a time in your house while you were doing all of that at all the same time. I'm not sure how we ever saw you, but we did. <laughs> um, Lila, can you follow that up? Yes, <laughs> NCJW taught me so much. I mean, from um, advocacy, we would go to the Washington Institutes and we would learn how to talk to our national figures to go and speak with senators and go and speak with our congressmen. And down even to the local level, it taught me how to plan a meeting, how to write an agenda, how to work with others. Um, the volunteers aren't, weren't always easy to work with. And so we had to learn how to, how to work around the volunteers because it's really hard to fire a volunteer. <laughs> <laughs> I would, you know, sometimes we wanted to, but we couldn't. Um, <laughs> it, uh, what else did it teach me? Uh, it, the, it, the, um, Lucy touched on this a little bit that NCJW worked on a three-year cycle of the Washington Institute um, one year and then we would have uh, all kinds of um, meetings another year and then we would have our business, our annual, triannual business um, where we would have all the sections come together. So those all taught us different things. I learned how to write a budget, I learned how to read a budget <laughs> and it really was a springboard for me for all of the other community work I, I, I did. It gave me practice in um, public speaking. I, I went on to become chair of the Susan G. Komen Foundation here in Atlanta. Um, I also am currently chairing the Alliance Theater Board. I've been involved with Piedmont Healthcare and on and on. So thank you NCJW for teaching me and giving me a, a good base and, and feeding my soul with such smart women. And, and it was an organization and is an organization that wasn't full of fluff. Oh, that was beautiful. Thanks, Lila. Lucy, you wanna share yours? I agree with everything Lila said <laughs> and all those things and more. Our leadership training was second to none. And uh, we were very, very lucky to have funding from the Lipschutz family that allowed us to have all that type of training. So not only did I have local training, but I also had uh, training on the national level for when we went to all those, um, the leadership training or the national events. Um, so when I moved on from being president, I was, able to get on many other nonprofit boards. And I felt confident in my abilities to do anything after all of that training. So thank you, NCJW. Thank you for all my friends that helped me when I was president and Marganata chair and treasurer and all those other things that all of us did to make this a great organization. Well, thank you, Lucy. I have so much to look forward to. Yes, you do. <laughs> Um, and now we turn the program over to a passionate leader who has helped shape the past, present, and future of Jewish Atlanta, Sherry Frank. Sherry served as NCJW's past president from 1973 to 1975 and currently serves as the Atlanta section president once more. She also sat on the national board of NCJW from 1978 to 1982. I now invite her to give us her closing remarks. Hi, everybody. Um, I have to just add that my years in NCJW also led me to all kinds of, um, gave me all kinds of skills, organizational skills, community contacts, and had led me to um, many things, including being president of Congregation or Hadash, 
and serving so proudly for 25 years as the Southeast Area Director of the American Jewish Committee. For me, commitment to NCJW is a lifetime passion, and I'm thrilled to be back as president in this critical moment in our nation's history. Maybe Maryland, the critical time of the 60s is really amplified by the critical time of the 2020s, and I'm glad to be right here. So let me thank everybody on this terrific panel. Marilyn Shubin, Beth Sugarman, Nancy Levine, Lila Hertz, and Lucy Sunshine. And a special thanks to you, Leslie Gordon, our gracious moderator. Through these 125 years, NCJW has participated with numerous agencies and organizations, and we are so proud to partner tonight with the Bremen and our NCJW archives are at the Bremen and we continue to give you more as we continue to do our programming. And I am doubly happy to thank our dynamic and talented mother-daughter team for co-chairing this 125th anniversary program. Trusted and seasoned leader, Michael Hart Hillman, we know you, we thank you. But rising star, Ansley Hillman Clare, Thank you, thank you, thank you for a job well done. Our future looks bright when we can look to the next generation. Pretend this was a film and you're now listening to, this, to all the credits as we present four slides that tell you about our glorious, historic 125 years of achievement for, for the National Council of Jewish Women. Good night and thank you to everyone.